Good morning, and welcome to morning prayer on this sixth Sunday after Pentecost. Lord, open our lips, and, and our mouth shall, shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. God rules over all the earth. O come, let us worship. This is the Jubilate. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve, Serve the Lord with gladness, gladness and, and come, come before, before his presence with a song. Know, know this, the Lord himself is God. He himself has made us, and we are his. We are the sheep of his pasture. Sheep of his pasture. Enter his, his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give, give thanks, thanks to him and call upon his name. name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his faithfulness endures from age to age. God rules over all the earth. O oh, come, let us worship. A reading from the book of Genesis. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel and Armenian of Palamro, sister of Laban and Armian. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer. And his wife, Rebekah, conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle, so they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out in his hand, gripping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man, living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff for I am famished. Therefore he was called Edom. Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. Esau said, I am about to die of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Here ends the first reading. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 119, beginning at the 105th verse. Your word is a lantern to my feet and a light upon my path. I have sworn and am determined to keep your righteous judgments. I am deeply troubled. 
Preserve my life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept, O Lord, the willing tribute of my lips and teach me your judgments. My life is always in my hand, yet I do not forget your law. The wicked have set a trap for me, but I have not strayed from your commandments. Your decrees are my inheritance forever. Truly, they are the joy of my heart. I have applied my heart to fulfill your statutes forever and to the end. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. There is therefore now so no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with sin. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, so it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who ate in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, Though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. Here ended the second reading. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there, while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on the rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil, and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatched, snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word 
and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, to Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. I invite you to pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer, we invite you to come, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Oh my goodness. I like the parables. I like how we can spend time contemplating who it is that Jesus is talking about and how it is that we fit into the story. We like to ask questions like, where do we see ourselves? Or what is it that Jesus is trying to tell the listener? In truth, Jesus offers nothing to the general hearers of the parables at any point that would enable them to understand the significance of what he's saying. The thing I don't like is when people, scholars, and theologians mostly, tell us who we are in the story, or what it is that we are supposed to hear in the story, or how we are supposed to change our hearts and minds and lives to be more like what they think Jesus is trying to get across. The reason I like the parable so much is because In spending time with the parables, I realize that Jesus is speaking more about how we hear the words of God than just telling us a particular story. Discernment, or the ability to hear spiritually, is necessary to understand Jesus' teachings. And hearing spiritually is related to the concept of deep listening. Deep listening is the idea that we listen with compassion. We listen to understand, and finally we listen with intention, specifically the intention to act. In other words, to open one's ears is to open one's heart. The parable of the sower and the seeds is one where I've read and heard so many different interpretations. Even with Jesus' explanation, which we hear in the second half of the gospel reading to the disciples, I've heard that we are the soil, we are the seeds, we are ourselves to become sowers. The simplicity of the story belies a deep complexity of understanding. The seed that lands where the soil has become hardened from being repeatedly walked on simply sits on the surface, waiting to become food for birds. The seed that falls on rocky soil has difficulty taking root because the soil inhibits the growth of the roots necessary for plants to access the nutrients in the soil. The seed that falls on ground covered in thorns must compete with already well-established invasive plants and stands little chance but the seed that falls on the soil that has been prepared, turned over, and loosened until it is fine, replenished with nutrients from the decaying matter of leaves and other organics, will thrive. From a seeming simple reduction of a simple-sounding parable, I come to a questionable conclusion, which is to say, I wonder, Could we in fact be soil, seed, sower at various points in our lives, dependent entirely on where we are in life and what we're going through? So sometimes we're the soil. Perhaps the most common interpretation, especially when we hear that Jesus explaining to the disciples that the listeners are in fact the soil. As a theologian, I was reading candidly admitted that this is by far the most likely of ways that we put ourselves into the story. Rick said, 
I've read the parable of the sower as descriptions of various people of groups, or various groups of people, as if there are certain people who are, no doubt about it, just plain rocky soil. Then there are others who hang out with the thorns. The lucky ones are the ones with healthy soil. But the uncomfortable reality is that I have good soil potential within me, and it's only a stone's throw from some seriously rocky ground, not far from the thorns and weeds either. They are all within me. And depending on the day, or the moment, or the circumstance, I end up presenting one or the other. I spend a lot of time looking at the ground I'm walking on. And I've come to see so many different kinds of dirt, all shaped by the world around it. And people are just the same. So many different kinds of people, all created in God's image and deeply affected by the world around them. Soil that is walked on over and over again gets beaten down so that it becomes packed hard. And it is clear that seeds will likely not go far when tossed onto it. Now change that sentence from soil to people. People who have been walked on over and over and over again often develop a hardened, tough exterior to protect themselves, and it's hard to break through. Or they get so beaten down and kept low by systemic oppressive structures that it's clear that they're not likely to get far even when the opportunity presents itself to grow something. Rocky soil is complicated. Just ask any farmer in this province how they feel about the rocks that make their way to the Earth's surface year after year. Jesus describes rocky soil as those who lack the staying power to deal with, well, rocky ground. When the going gets rough, they go into retreat. Then there is ground so covered by thorns and weeds, much like my backyard garden right now. It's overcrowded back there. I have bleeding hearts in the lee of the valley, but you can't see them because the weeds and thorns have completely overcrowded it all. The soil filled with thorns easily translates into our own overcrowded lives. There is no room in an already overplanted plot for anything more even when we double dig the beds. Good soil. Oh Lord, let my heart be good soil, open, willing to learn, tended and cultivated to promote the best kind of growth for those seeds of faith. Those seeds that Jesus says are the words of God so maybe it's too much of a stretch to think that we are seeds in this parable. Yet when I contemplate these seeds, I like to think that Jesus' explanation of the seeds is not what we typically think about seeds. When you plant a seed, you're already dreaming of what it's going to yield, what's going to come. But in this parable, it's not about how much the seeds produce. It's about the way in which God's word has taken hold in you. This is not a competition to hear to, about who hears God's word better. It's about what the hearing creates in you. Still, that makes us sound like soil and also like sowers or gardeners. And as a theologian and a scholar, I admit that it feels obvious that God is the sower in this parable, and that it is also curious that Jesus talks about scattering seed, but not tending it. In the Hebrew scriptures, books like Jeremiah and Hosea depict God as the one who sows the seeds. And in the gospel books, it is Jesus who sows the seeds. But Jesus is also teaching the apostles to become sowers of the words of God also. So it is telling 
But the sower in this parable scatters the seed carelessly, recklessly, seemingly wasting much of the seed on ground that holds little promise for a fruitful harvest. Jesus invests in disciples who look similarly unpromising. He squanders his time with tax collectors and sinners, lepers and the demon-possessed and all manner of outcasts. The last bit of Jesus' explanation is important. Even in good soil, the results are varied. There is no way for those who sow to know what the yield will be. Biblical scholar Dominic Crossan emphasizes that it is not so much the size of the harvest that counts, but the fact that it happens at all. However big or small the harvest against such opposition, there is a miraculous quality to it. It is a gift with graciousness and surprise that is meant to make us think of the kingdom of God. And that could be our message today. Maybe it's not about our work and our effort. Maybe we can't do it all on our own. Seeds landing on hard and rocky ground stand less of a chance, maybe. But I've seen with my own eyes trees growing out of rocks and flowers coming up out of the pavement. The one thing I am certain of is this. While we are setting up trying to be good soil or good seeds or setting out trying to sow good seeds in the good soil around us, the parable and the word of God reminds us that it's actually all about God's work in the world. And I find an incredible amount of hope in that. I might add that as we work toward being a new parish and as those entrusted with Jesus' mission today, we might spend some time considering the implications of this parable for how we engage in mission. Too often, we're playing it safe, sowing the word only where we're confident it will be well received, and only where those who receive it are likely to become contributing members of our congregation. In the name of stewardship, we hold tightly to our resources, wanting to make sure that nothing is wasted. We stifle creativity and energy for mission, resisting new ideas for fear that they might not work, as though mistakes or failures are to be avoided at all costs. The Word of God says it's different. It's not about us. It's about God's work in the world. Let anyone with ears listen. Let us pray. Holy One, some days we are the soil, receiving the words of God and allowing them to grow within us. Empower us to be the best soil that we can be. Sometimes we are the seeds, your small words sent out and scattered to grow where we fall. Empower us to take root and surprise in the unlikeliest of places. And sometimes, you give us a bag of seeds to sow. Empower us to trust that not knowing what the end results will be, you have a big hand in what's happening, and we want to participate. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our faith together as we say the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us lift our hearts, hands, and voices in prayer to God on behalf of all people. Heavenly Father, thank you for the simple images of seeds and soil. Thank you that the common can speak to your deeper truths and mysteries within us. Thank you we don't need degrees, a corner office, or a million Twitter followers to bear rich fruit to your glory and for the nourishment of people famished for your healing and life-giving love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our our prayer. prayer. Fill the church, O Lord, with the Holy Spirit. Make it beautiful with holiness and rich with wisdom. Let your word take root in it and accomplish that which you purpose. Draw all flesh into its courts, hear their prayers, forgive their sins, and accomplish their salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear hear our our prayer. prayer. Grant patience, courage, and gentleness to everyone who is persecuted on account of Jesus. And do not let their witness, O Lord, to you return to you empty. Uproot the stones and weeds from the hearts of their tormentors so that they may bear the fruits of repentance and be saved. Lord, in your mercy, hear hear our prayer. prayer. Deal mercifully with the 421 congregations, O God. Make our words, deliberations, and ministries faithful and fruitful uprooted the deep-rooted weeds and removed the stubborn stones of sin from the fields of our lives. Break down the hard-trodden paths of worldly customs. Make your word grow so richly that many hearts may be nourished through our presence in your world. Lord, in your mercy, hear hear our our prayer. We pray, O Lord, for the Anglican Church of Papua New Guinea and the Most Reverend Alan Meiji, Archbishop of Papua New Guinea. We pray for the Anglican Church of Canada, Bishop William Cliff, the clergy and people of the Diocese of Brandon. For ELCIC Bishop Larry Kokendorfer, the people and rostered ministers of the Synod of Alberta and the Territories, and for the National Anglican and Lutheran Worship Conference. Give grace to these our Anglican and Lutheran brothers and sisters so they may joyfully serve you in fullness of Christ's love for his church. Give them continued strength to overcome the trials and tribulations of ministry in a global pandemic and lead them to places of rest, waiting on you, O Lord, for their daily bread. Lord, in your mercy, hear our our prayer. prayer. We praise you for favorable weather and fruitful earth for the fields and orchards, flocks and herds, streams and seas, which nourish nourish us all. Bless farmers and ranchers, fishers and shepherds, gardeners, and all whose knowledge and effort helps to protect, preserve, and wisely use the gifts of creation. Help us to be generous stewards of your bounty, sharing with all who are in need. Lord, in your mercy. Hear Hear our our prayer. prayer. We give thanks, O Lord, for the court decision to strike down actions to build the Dakota Access Pipeline that would jeopardize the ancestral homeland of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. We give thanks for their leadership, perseverance, and strength to overcome old, selfish, and corrupt ways of thinking and being that would continue to threaten our home planet. Help us to keep praying, O Lord, for the elders amongst us who offer their wisdom and knowledge to support the resistance. Lord, in your mercy, hear hear our prayer. prayer. We pray for this nation, beset by troubles and strife, yet still our beloved country. 
reform its laws, purify its speech, instruct its leaders, and soften every heart to see one another as your beloved children, created in your image, and redeemed at great cost by your dear Son. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. You intend for us to live in joy and peace, yet in this sin-darkened world, violence, injustice, and evil threaten so many. We pray for those tasked with defending life and liberty. Conform their actions to your will so all, especially our black and indigenous brothers and sisters, may enjoy the fruits of safety, concord, freedom, and justice. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our, hear our prayer. prayer. Bring healing and hope to everyone who is afflicted by sorrow, suffering, and sin, especially those you have placed in our hearts to pray. Lead them out of their darkness of depression, anxiety, anger, and fear into the brightness of your saving love. Grant peace to the hearts and joy to their loved ones, that together they may praise your awesome deeds of salvation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. prayer. Thank you, dear Father, for all who have died trusting in you. Lead and guide us, who still walk a road that is stony and desolate, overgrown with the thorns of sin and briars of violence. Refresh us with the, in this wilderness. Give us nourishment of our, for our bodies, hope for our hearts and your spirit to abide with us along life's way. Crown our years with blessing. By the merits of your dear Son, gather us safely to yourself, where with all whom you have redeemed, we may sing with joy forever. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Receive and graciously answer our prayer, Heavenly Father, for the sake of your dear Son. And, the power, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, give us the strength and will to accomplish whatever you call us to do. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Last week, Pastor Jofi provided a theological reflection for one of the five potential names for our new parish. That name was Emmanuel. After much prayer and discussion, research and opinions, consultation and deliberation, the renewal, renewal team has finalized the short list. The five potential names are Emmanuel, St. Joseph's, Church of the Ascension, St. Uriel, and Tree of Life. Today, I will be giving a brief theological reflection on the name Tree of Life. The Tree of Life appears both at the beginning of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, where it's mentioned as being in the Garden of Eden, and at the end of the Bible, in the book of Revelations, where it is a powerful image of hope and healing. The 22nd chapter of the book of Revelations starts by saying, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and from the Lamb, and through the middle of the streets of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, each producing, producing its fruit each month, and the leaves of the trees are for the healings of the nations. The tree is a gift, producing not just one kind of fruit, but twelve. Twelve for the twelve tribes of Israel, for the twelve months of the year. Twelve is a significant number to the first hearers of the book of Revelation. It is a number that signifies completion or totality and wholeness. The tree of life produces everything you need. And beyond that, the leaves. The very things that you can't eat, that are just there, have not an insignificant use for the healing of the nations. This is a pretty incredible tree. The tree and the river are often tied together in Scripture, and when we finally get to go to, on pilgrimage to the Holy Land, you'll be able to understand why. 
For a tree to grow strong and tall in an arid climate, it needs a source of water, a source of life. This image of a tree being nourished and growing strong by the outpouring of God's grace can even be seen in the very first of the Psalms. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the ways that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night, that person is like a tree planted by a stream of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaves do not wither. Whatever they do prospers. A tree of life is a growing thing, alive and adapting, producing fruit of all kind, but it is more than that. Ancient tradition, and especially the Orthodox Church, understands that the tree of life is not just some random, albeit miraculous, tree, but rather they understand the tree of life to be the very cross of Christ himself. Think about it. In Genesis, Adam and Eve take the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They eat it, and fall from grace. We believe and proclaim that this fall has been undone by Christ washing away the sins of the whole world by his death upon, our, upon a cross. In our most central sacrament, communion, the Lord's Supper, we partake of the fruit of that cross, Jesus' body and blood. And every time we take communion, we are eating and drinking the fruit of salvation. We say, the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation, preserve thy body and soul into eternal life. One of my favorite Lenten hymns expresses this so beautifully and articulately that I just have to quote it here. God in pity saw man fallen, shamed and sunk in misery, when he fell on death by tasting fruit of that forbidden tree. Then, Another tree was chosen, which the world from death should free. Faithful cross, above all others, one and holy noble tree, none in foliage, none in blossom, none in peer thy fruit may be. Sweetest wood and sweetest iron, sweetest weight is hung on thee. The tree of life is a powerful and multifaceted name and it challenges us to continually grow, to continually be bearing fruit, to continually dig deeper and deeper into our faith, to be refreshed by God's gifts and to stand firm, never wilting, never withering from persecution. It challenges us to let God be the gardener, to prune us and to shape us. But should we live into this calling, we will have much to offer for a tree never truly exists on its own. A whole host of things depend on trees. Spiders make their webs in its branches. Animals rest under the shadows of its leaves. It creates a whole ecosystem around itself. And even those who cannot or choose not to be fed from the same river benefit from the source of life that feeds those deep roots. Is our faith deep enough and grounded enough to be a tree of life in this city? Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we come before you at this time seeking your wisdom and guidance as we move forward in the mission of our five to one churches in the naming of our new parish. Give us a vision of your new creation in Regina Walk with us as we go through this process, knowing that it is your church, Lord, and that your mind will become clearer to us. Give us strength not to shrink from the hard decisions, and help us encourage and uphold each other, and bless us with the nourishing power of your Spirit. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. This is the collect for today. Almighty God, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. 
May we find peace in your service and in the world to come see you face to face. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Gathering our prayers and praises into one, let us pray as our Savior taught us. Our Father, Father in heaven, heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. It's pretty exciting to finally have that short list of five names. Emmanuel, St. Joseph, Tree of Life, Church of the Ascension, and St. Uriel. Now, some of you will really, really like some of those names and wonder what on earth were people thinking about the others. Now, the truth is that what you're thinking is a fantastic name. Some other people might be thinking is an absolutely terrible choice. The nature of humanity is that we don't always see eye to eye. This process is steeped in prayer. And it is not simply a popularity contest, trying to figure out which one is the best choice for the majority. Choosing a name has a significant theological impact but also for the name to shape what we might become. As such, we encourage you to have conversations with your friends, your neighbors, your children, or your parents, to talk about what names you like, maybe do some research online to figure out why these choices were made, what's the possibility behind them. But the naming committee and the renewal team are going to hold off on gathering your opinions until all of the videos, all of the reflections have been put out. That way, we can give time, thought, and prayer into this process of naming. I'd like to thank you, and I'd like to encourage you to engage in conversation with each other, with the ministerial team, with me and myself, um, so that as we go through, we can carefully and thoughtfully discern the name which we are called to carry into the future. Have a blessed day.